Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am acutely aware, standing here um, in Edinburgh, with a name like Duncan Anderson, that my accent might not measure up to your expectations. So um, I, I know you always told not to apologize at the start of a talk, um, but uh, I, I'm sorry if my accent's not quite Scottish enough for you. Um, my wife, who is very Scottish and does have a Scottish accent, um, when I was uh, discussing with her last night um, what kind of dress code might be today, she said, why don't you wear your kilt? Um, <laughs> I had to advise that I wasn't quite sure it was that sort of event. So, um, so you're stuck with an Englishman uh, in a suit. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk to you today um, about a subject that um, I'm really, really excited about. Um, in IBM Watson, um, we're completely focused on um, creating this new type of technology. Um, we refer to it as cognitive computing. Um, it has a huge potential, uh, and it has potential for not just IBM, but for lots of organizations, lots of businesses, to build new types of businesses, new types of products that are based on this, this technology um, that we're building, um, and in fact, which others are building as well. So we're not the only ones operating in this kind of space. Um, lots of the big internet companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, etc., they're all investing heavily in this area of technology, and we think it's going to completely transform the, the types of things that you can do with computers. So um, I hope there's a few in the audience who might be inspired by this talk and go away and think, well, what can I do that's based on cognitive, cognitive technology and uh, IBM Watson? Um, so to kick things off, um, so, so reference to humans there, um, my favorite film at the moment is Ex, Ex Machina. Um, very similar in kind of concept to uh, humans. Is, has anyone seen Ex Machina in the audience? Quick show of hands. Yeah, it's this good spattering of people who are AI buffs, hopefully. Um, it's a fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely go and see it. It's utterly brilliant. Uh, if not least because it's underplayed. It's very subtle. This idea that you have a, um, a humanoid that uh, is interacting and which essentially it tricks the humans uh, and uh, gives this idea that it's, it's really intelligent and it has a soul and it's thinking and it has emotions. Now, it's a computer, so it doesn't really, or does it? That's the sort of thing they're playing with in the film. Now, um, I'm a bit of an AI buff, uh, but uh, the, the problem with these kind of films is that they're very futuristic. So we're not gonna do this tomorrow. The technology we're dealing with uh, is uh, at the very early stages. Right? So even the people who uh, are most aggressive in their projections about this kind of technology are saying that uh, computers that are more intelligent than people are at least 50 years away. It's, it's possible, some of us in the audience, some of the younger ones, may see this kind of thing happen within your lifetimes. Um, and there's a, there's a book called Superintelligence um, that's worth reading uh, if you're into this kind of stuff. Uh, and there's very, at the start of it, um, there's a sort of survey of the academics looking at uh, what's happening in this field. Um, and there is a consensus that, you know, in the something like the 50 year time frame, this stuff it becomes real, which is quite exciting. But for what we're doing right now, it's much more prosaic. So we don't tend to use the phrase artificial intelligence in Watson, we use the phrase cognitive computing, because um, Artificial intelligence is a bit of a loaded concept. It, immediately people start thinking about ex machina and humans and what does it mean for the, uh, the human race, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and the reality is what we're dealing with now, we don't have any of those concerns. We don't have those kind of ethical concerns about should the computer, is it really a person or is it not a person? Right? We're dealing with stuff which can help, can assist, can solve real problems, um, but doesn't threaten humanity for, for many years yet. So. Um, we avoid artificial intelligence, I think cognitive computing is much more kind of practical sort of a phrase to use. Um, now for us in Watson Group, um, this journey started out um, with a grand challenge that was set to the organization to build a computer system that could uh, play on this US TV program called Jeopardy. Uh, Jeopardy is a general knowledge quiz program, it's a bit of an institution in the US. Uh, people, uh, pretty much any American you speak to, um, will have watched Jeopardy. Um, so to, to have a computer system which took part and played against the best human operators on Jeopardy, that's Ken and Brad, 
uh, on the screen there. Um, Ken and Brad were the best players. They'd, they'd won a lot of money over the years by being good Jeopardy players. We built a computer system which ingested lots of information, so articles from Wikipedia, uh, back issues of Time magazine, encyclopedias, reads all of this natural language text, makes sense of it, and then goes on a, on a TV show and beats the best human operators. So it needed to do two things. Number one, it needed to know lots of stuff, because it's general knowledge, so anything could come up. And number two, it needed to understand the English language, and not just the language that I'm using right now, but the way that it's used on the TV show, which is full of fun puns and plays on words, very complicated use of the language. And in fact, I watch clips from the Jeopardy show, and I've pretty much got no clue what they're asking, because it's, it, you have to kind of be in that culture about the way they're asking questions to make sense of the question. Uh, so it's really hard, and we needed to build a computer that understood that. And that's what we did in 2011. Uh, and since 2011, we've been taking the technology that we built there and building a business on top of it, and that's the Watson division in IBM. And we've done lots of things since then. Um, uh, some of them are much more significant than playing a game. Uh, so we, we've launched this thing called the Watson Health Division. Now, Watson Health is saying, uh, we think we could take this kind of technology and we could uh, change the way that healthcare is provided, completely change people's lives, save people's lives. So the first thing we did was build a thing called Watson Oncology Advisor, which takes the, the knowledge of the, some top cancer specialists in the US, distilled it into a computer system, and that computer system um, helps to diagnose and recommend treatment plans for people with cancer. So the idea is you take the knowledge from a part of the world which has excellent cancer care, you just distill it into a system, and then you can take that system to parts of the world which probably have less good cancer care. And you can save people's lives by doing that. And that's something that's actively going on. Another thing that we've been doing, because this isn't just about natural language text, it's about all sorts of data types that traditionally we would put in a database and computers would just store them. We couldn't do anything with them. So if you have an article in a publication talking about uh, some new theory about how to treat cancer, a, a computer couldn't understand it, but Watson can. If you take an image, a computer can't understand what that image is. All it can do is store it. Well, Watson can. So one of the things we've been doing is taking images of skin cancer and trying to get Watson to the stage where uh, it's as good as the best humans at recognizing what is or is not a skin cancer. Um, so, so just a, a personal story to, to bring alive what that really means. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I noticed a, a skin blemish and uh, went to the doctor and she said, it's probably nothing to worry about, um, but I'd like you to, you to see a dermatologist, just to be sure. Um, luckily, I work for a, a large company which gives me private health insurance, so I could get to see the dermatologist quite quickly, but it was still two weeks. And two weeks, when you're wondering, is this something I should worry about? Was the doctor just being kind? Was she sort of trying not to stress me out? Um, was there really something more going on? Or um, is I, am I okay, I'm just stressing about nothing? Because she said it's probably okay. Um, so two weeks later, I see the dermatologist, and he says, it's absolutely fine, nothing to worry about. But you've had two weeks where you're worrying about it. And that's in the best case scenario. People who don't have access to private health care probably had to wait much longer than I did. If you imagine the type of technology we're talking about, in the future it would be possible to take out your mobile phone, take a photograph of the thing that's worrying you, and it will be able to advise you whether you should see a doctor or not. And that advice won't just be some kind of amateur thing. It will be uh, trained by the world's best cancer uh, detectives. People who, so it would be a system which would be medical grade. And that's what we're heading towards. So the, the ability for this kind of technology to completely transform the way that we give, give health care and uh, give you answers to your questions really, really quickly without you having to go on a waiting list to get to see a human. Now, clearly, there will be times when you will need to see the human, 
but we can simplify the process and get a lot of the stress and worry out of the system and get the people who need to see the humans, get the focus on those. Um, another example for you. Um, so I'm wearing my Apple Watch. Um, there was a report uh, a month or so ago about a guy who had a heart problem. Um, so this thing takes my heart rate every 10 minutes. It stores it on my phone. And so I have a record of my heart rate every 10 minutes stored on my phone. This guy had a heart problem. He goes to the doctor, and it turns out that uh, for this kind of problem, what usually happens is they give you a heart rate monitor, and you go away for a week, takes the records, and then you come back, and they work out what should they should do about it. He turned up with his iPhone, and the doctor looked at that and said, I can see exactly what the problem is. You need this simple procedure. Booked him in the next day. It was done. <coughs> so immediate access to the problem because he's taking the data and he's making sense of it. And that's what we're trying to do in Watson Health, is it massively accelerate the way that we can get to the treatment and cut down the stress and the worry and all the inefficiencies of a system with lots of waiting lists and complexities around how we get to see the right people. So we think this stuff has the capability to transform lives um, and to transform the efficiency of healthcare systems. Um, so another example, so I'm gonna be really, really brave here and attempt a live demo. Um, so anything could happen at this point. Um, so we have, just to show you the kind of thing we can do, um, this is a system called Watson News Explorer. So this is taking uh, the, new, the world's news, and we ingest the world's news, and we, we try to make sense of it. So we're looking at articles that people have written, text, in, in the English language. And then we're trying to work out what the article's about. We're trying to work out um, organizations, people, et cetera, mentioned in that article. So what you see there is a sort of knowledge, oops, knowledge graph of uh, IBM. Now, since we're in Scotland, I thought we could do something a bit more topical. And we could see what Watson can find out about the First Minister. As I say, this is a live demo, so <laughs> something's happening, which is good. Okay, so let's zoom out a bit. So at the center here, we have Nicola. We have a little clip, clip from uh, Wikipedia, some articles here. But if I zoom in a bit, so there's Nicola. There is an organization, the Scottish National Party, kind of makes sense. Um, Scottish Parliament, something else she's very closely associated with. Um, we have uh, some articles over here. We have an organization, the UK Labour Party. I don't know, I'm not sure who that is. Just testing my knowledge of, of <laughs> Scottish politics, possibly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, um, close to the Labour Party. Uh, Ed Miliband, and there's some articles here and uh, yeah, so there's some articles here which there's a topic in the news about what does the election of Jeremy Corbyn as the Labour Party leader mean for um, independence and the Scottish National Party and Nicola Sturgeon. So we can see there's a topic of interest in the press there. And we can see uh, David Cameron up here. I guess David Cameron and Nicola are gonna be, there's gonna be articles discussing the two of them. Alex Salmond, right, so we can see there's a whole bunch of stuff over here. I'm sure this is, Okay, so this is stuff with Nicola talking about experience of the election. Uh, Alistair Darling, clearly a key figure in that election. Scottish government. So you get the idea, right? So we can create these knowledge graphs by processing natural language text and we can make sense of it and we can get a sense of what's going on, what's happening in the news, not just some kind of random thing. This is if you like, crowdsourcing from the world's news newspapers, blogs, online reports, etc. Crowdsourcing what the topics of interest are, what people are talking about. Um, another example for you. So again, I'm continuing my braveness. So um, this is a system uh, which uses the technology and we have processed all the TED Talks. Right? So we've looked at, ingested, what everyone's talking about in the TED Talks, and we've built a system where you can ask questions about those TED Talks. So I can say, um, how, 
lifestyles, money relate to happiness. So Watson has processed that and it's come back and said, there's a few TED Talks here which seem to relate to this concept. And it's not just um, founder TED Talks that it thinks relate to that concept. It's taking you straight to the part of that talk. So there might be just one short two minute bit where the guy's talking about that concept and um, Watson finds you that, that part of the TED Talk. Okay. So in the, in the broadcast industry, <laughs> The ability to actually make sense and find information, which previously we would have had people manually tagging these things and saying, oh, this, this talk is about this, this bit in the video is about this. Very, very manually intensive process. Now we can build a system which does that automatically by, by reading uh, the contents of the talk. Um, and then uh, this is another part of this. All right. Okay, we'll call it a day on that since uh, that bit doesn't seem to want to work for me. Um, so this idea that the concept of cognitive technology um, can build new types of computer systems. Now you, you can do the mental agility thing here and say if we can build those kind of systems, there has to be new business opportunities behind that. Right? This, somebody could build a system um, which does something a bit like the TED thing, which helps broadcasters to index um, video, for example. Right? Um, there's huge opportunities. Um, and um, one of the things we have in, in Watson is uh, an ecosystems team. And their job is to go around, uh, mentor, and help organizations who are looking to build businesses on top of this kind of technology and encourage them and uh, try to help them to bring things to market. Um, because clearly, if people build stuff on top of Watson, then that's good for us, and it's good for the economy, and it's good for small business as well. So that's what we're trying to do with this stuff. Um, so I wanted to take, uh, so I've given you a sort of very broad overview of some of the things that we're doing. I wanted to take a slightly more specific view. So uh, I would guess there's probably more than a couple of people in the audience who feel a bit like this sometimes when they're trying to get something done. Um, maybe you're using a computer system. Maybe you're trying to, um, I don't know, speak to um, your electricity company about some problem with your bill or something. Or um, you're talking to your, your bank and you've um, forgotten your online password. Um, often these things are really simple problems, but the way that we solve them is really complicated. Uh, I, I've done a, a, a short survey of um, uh, websites where you've lost your password. Right? How quickly can you find the page where it says, press this button to reset your password? And typically, it's about half a dozen web pages you have to go through before you get there. And it's not uncommon for the first thing you have to do is to click on log in. Right? It's obvious to me that's a good starting point. It's not obvious to my 85-year-old mother-in-law that if she's forgotten her password, she should click on log in. That's not obvious. So there's a lot of frustration with how do you get things done. Right? We spend a lot of time with this stuff. Um, and I think we're moving towards a world where um, we can use cognitive technologies to build systems where we can just very simply ask that question. Right? So 1990, Google launched. I remember using it back then. Um, it, it was amazing at the time because it didn't have any clutter. It was just the search box. You type your question in and it finds the answer. Right? And what we're doing with Watson is, is providing the kind of technology for any organization to build that search box for you to say, you know, how do I change my password? So rather than randomly clicking on links on a web page to get to the reset password page, you can just type in on the front page, how do I change my password? And we can get there really, really quickly. And I argue that 1990, we've been, Google's been training us in this style of interaction for uh, you know, 25 years. Um, 
And I, I find myself, um, occasionally I've lost my car keys. Uh, and you, you're kind of so used to now typing stuff into Google that you, you sort of almost find yourself thinking, oh, could I say to Google, where's my car keys? Well, clearly you can't. Um, but, but I think mentally we're in that space. Right? We should be able to ask simple questions and get answers. And technology which can understand the English language, can understand the intent of what you're asking, and then can help you get an answer to that problem. Um, that's what we're dealing with. That stuff is now available and anyone can use it. Uh, yeah, so uh, a <laughs> bit of a quip at Google. Um, Google can bring back 100,000 answers, a librarian can bring you back the right one. So that's what we're talking about here is the ability for people to build computer systems that uh, get you straight to the answer. We're not looking for, oh, you know, here's 10 possible hits on our website which potentially talk about changing passwords, which is typically today, you might have a little search box in the corner somewhere. That's what they're dealing with. That's the kind of answers you get back. Um, with a Watson-based system, we can build something that gets you straight to the right answer. Um, a lot of people talk about social media. Um, and in Watson, we do uh, quite a bit of work looking at what people are talking about on social media. Um, because if we can understand what somebody's put in a Facebook comment or a tweet, then we can go from the abstract of oh, you've got 10,000 followers and you know, that kind of stuff. We can go to the more specific and say, what are people talking about? What are the topics that are being discussed about your brand on Twitter? Um, but my guess is that a lot of that comment, when it's aimed at companies, is probably not there for any reason other than people are letting off steam because they're frustrated. Going back to my picture of the lady shaking her head. I certainly have a habit of, um, if, if I'm annoyed and frustrated with an organization, I'll have a habit of going to Twitter and I'll say, oh, see what happens, right? Because a lot of these organizations are listening and you find um, BT is a good example. Your broadband goes down. If you go and, and tweet to BT Care, you'll get excellent response from them because they don't want you complaining about them in the public space for natural reasons. But why am I there in the first place? Why am I tweeting about BT? It's because the traditional channels haven't worked for me. So I'm using this, I'm, I'm taking advantage of the fact that they're gonna be embarrassed by my tweet. Um, so the argument goes, a lot of the activity on the social channels when it's related to business is there because people haven't provided uh, an adequate way to get those answer, questions answered. So if I could type into BT's website, um, help my broadbands down, and I got some decent, sensible advice and help coming back to me, then I probably would never go to Twitter and complain in the first place. Right. So again, lots of reasons why we can build new types of systems which solve new types of problems, going back to the TED and the, the, the News Explorer stuff, but also solve existing problems in new ways. Right. My broadband's down, I need some help. And the telephone system's a nightmare. I have to go about 10 levels deep in press one, four, press two, four, and it's just so frustrating and annoying, and then I get on a, put on a, a hold and oh, drives me around the bend. Um, so there's lots of organizations which are investing in what I'd refer to as digital assistants. Uh, so all the consumer-facing organizations like Google, uh, Microsoft and Apple, um, building these kind of things. Who in this room, quick show of hands, who uses one of these kind of things on a regular basis? Interesting. So I, I don't know, 10, 20%, something like that. Um, there's a quote there, uh, it's a research that Google did. In the US, more than half of teens are using voice search on a daily basis. Um, and it's interesting, when I talk to audiences about this topic, it completely polarizes. I get people who say, oh, I never use those things, they're completely useless. And I get other people who say, I use it all the time, it's fantastic. Um, and, and I think that partially that's a, a comment on the maturity of the technology, partially it's a comment on our experience as humans being retrained to use a digital assistant, right? Um, so things, it, for us, change is hard, and we get used to a way of working. But for younger people, I think there is evidence that 
being able to talk to a computer and uh, type an answer or, or speak a, sorry, type a question or speak a question in natural language is something they want to do. Uh, at Facebook's M is a very interesting example. Um, they're actually blending the computer with humans. So when you have a discussion with Facebook M, you don't know if it's a human or whether it's a computer, but it could be either, which is really interesting because um, cognitive technology is typically very good at the 80%, right? The, the, the kind of 80% of what we're asking about is pretty straightforward. So cognitive technology can solve those problems. And then you get into the 20%, which is the long tail of really, really obscure and really specific problems um, when you really need a human because it's you know, so many variables involved. Um, and being able to hand off between a computer and a human um, is part of what's going on here. So you can start off, you can do 80% of your work with a computer, and then 20% of the people will get handed off when the computer gets a bit stuck gets handed off to a human. Uh, and I see, I was with um, a large organization a few weeks ago who'd invested a, a lot of money in building a web chat team. Big company, um, based in the UK. They had about 200 people there doing web chat. And I spent the day with them, shadowing them, and, and seeing what's involved in being a web chat operator. Right? And I can tell you, 80% of the questions were really straightforward. They were basically there because people couldn't be bothered to click a few links and find the answer themselves. So as soon as you offer, type your question, people will do it because it's easier than clicking the links. And then the 20% needed a human involved, but actually what happened was the, the, the web chat operators said, in this example, I think you should phone our help desk. So, so my comment back was, I think Watson can do 80% of what you're doing and the 20% is going to go to the phone anyway because it's so complicated. It's, it's, you need a conversation. It's, it's hard work typing this stuff in. Um, so why have you invested in web chat? So there's a lot of this the kind of dynamics of what makes up a call center is, is going to change from today. There's lots of people on the telephone, people beginning to think maybe some of that's going to go to web chat. Well, I'd argue some of that will go to an automated assistant and the humans will be dealing with the complicated queries. So lots of dynamics changing around how this stuff is done. Uh, so this, there's an interesting survey here. Um, this guy had done some work, uh, he, he lived in China, and uh, it's comment on apps in China and how they differ to apps in the Western world. Uh, and it turns out that the Chinese have really got this sussed. So all the big brands are on um, chat systems, things like WeChat. Um, you know, you kind of message what's the, the Chinese equivalent of WhatsApp. They're on there, and you can chat with um, BT or uh, your bank or whoever. They have official presences, and you can chat with them on a chat system. Um, and some of them are automated. Some of them are using humans. But the primary interface is chat. In fact, I saw this the other, the other day. There's um, a guy, I was just coming off of an airplane, and there was a guy, a um, Chinese guy. And as soon as the plane landed, he got his phone out, and he was, he was chatting away. And, and he was chatting with his bank, because I talked to him afterwards. And, and I assumed to start with, he was you know, saying, I've just landed da -da, with his friends. But no, he was chatting with his bank about a problem with his bank statement. Um, so. There's lots of evidence that this is a really good way for people to interact with computers. Um, so, to take that a bit further and say, well, what does that mean? How do we build um, these kind of systems? What's the technology? Uh, oh yes, so, <laughs> this all started back in 1966. Um, there's a system called ELISA, uh, which was um, a sort of quotes artificially intelligent um, chatbot psychologist, so you could have a chat with the psychologist. Um, it, was, it, it wasn't a psychologist, it was completely fake, um, but it was quite fun. And uh, I remember typing this into my, I think it was a Commodore 64 back in the 1980s, and having a great laugh chatting with this thing. Um, so this idea of computers which can interact in natural language isn't new. Um, and I noticed uh, 
some guy has um, pitted Siri against Eliza. Um, and this was quite fun, right? So, um, taking the Eliza program and uh, got Siri to talk to it. Now, there's something interesting going on here, you know. Uh, a, it's funny, and I, I, I'm not convinced that Siri comes out on top on this conversation. I think the 1966 Eliza seems slightly better to me. Um, but you notice Siri seems a little bit obsessed with trying to do something. She's kind of focused in on, you want to book a hotel? No, I don't want to book a hotel. Right, but, and that's because Siri is an assistant that has been built to get certain tasks done. So she knows she's not there to have a chat. Right? She's there to get things done, very specific things. Right? And this is where people get frustrated because she doesn't do enough yet. Um, so she's focusing in on I'm trying to take you down a path and focus that conversation on something she knows sh she can do. Um, and that's wh when we started out at the beginning of this talk talking about artificial intelligence and the movies and everything. For me, this is the big difference today. We're not building these kind of systems that uh, are, are there to have a chat and pretend they're humans. We're building systems that can get specific tasks done. They're very task focused. They're very domain focused. So we're training these systems on a narrow domain of knowledge, not to talk about general knowledge, although that's where we started with the, the Jeopardy program. Um, but everything we're doing is focused on solving specific problems, a bit like Siri here. Um, so taking that idea that Siri was getting a bit narrow focused, um, what we see is two parts to the brain for these kind of systems. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, um, what we refer to as deep QA. Um, so this is the ability to have documents and to ask questions and um, find answers to difficult problems from a large body of textual information. Right? So you might um, ingest uh, you know, documents you have around your topic and then you can find answers to problems without having to go and read the document. But that, that's quite a passive conversation because you say, what's the answer to? And the system says, the answer is X. Um, the other half to it is, is dialogue, which is a directed conversation where the system knows it needs to get a job done and it knows there's probably a process or there's maybe some information it needs to collect. And there's some, a set of rules behind how this behavior should, should exhibit itself. So the two parts of these systems, you blend the two together, you get a very powerful um, system which, which can do a lot of things for you. So the way that we're building these things in Watson is we're building a, a, a set of um, services uh, which anyone can take advantage of. Um, so if you are uh, interloper from the uh, developers thing earlier on, um, I can say that these are REST APIs. If you're not, you probably don't know what that means, but that doesn't matter. Um, the, the essence is we're building services which run on the cloud and then anyone can build a business which um, hooks into those and builds your application which uses um, language translation or speech to text, for example, um, or uh, dialogue. Um, the ability to actually build your own applications, your new businesses, which exploits the underlying capabilities of cognitive technology. Um, so there's an interesting one there, um, tone analyzer. So that allows you to identify the tone of the conversation. Right? Is the person annoyed? Are they happy? Um, one of the other things um, we've been doing is, is building personality profiles. So if you take a piece of text that you've written, I can give it to Watson, and Watson will tell you a psychological profile. What kind of person are you? So we're beginning to get into the space where these systems are not just dealing on facts. How do I change my password? This is the process for changing my password. They're beginning to deal and pick up on human emotions and personalities and identify that you've, the way that you're talking to me, I'm, sus I'm getting suspect, suspect that you're getting a bit frustrated. And this links into the, then we bring in the human because right? we're testing the boundaries of what a computer can do at this point. Right, so I'm going to um, be brave again. So this is, again, a live demo. So I hope the demo gods are with me. 
Um, so this is uh, a prototype we built for a bank um, to show the kind of things that are possible. So you imagine a typical banking app on your phone. You can kind of look at your, uh, your accounts and your transactions, etc. cetera. Um, but you also have a Watson button. Um, so you can chat with, your, with Watson. And it looks just like using your messages app or WhatsApp or something on your phone. Right? But you're talking to the computer system and you're asking questions about your banking status. So uh, I can say, oh, yeah, computer. Right, okay, so we've got an answer. It'd be kind of trivial, um, but I can do something a bit more serious. So um, if you imagine uh, I've lost my credit card. Um, I don't often phone my bank because I do all my banking on my mobile these days, so I don't know the telephone number. And the telephone number is on the back of the card that I've lost on a broad telephone. Calls are quite expensive. I don't even know which number to call. It's all uh, horrid. So I can say, help, I've lost my So um, the system at this point, because um, I'm logged in, the system uh, recognizes the account. So yes, it is that account that I've got the problem with. Uh, is your PIN number secret? Yes, I'm not that stupid. OK, so Watson's now looked at my bank statement, and it's pulled out the last three transactions, uh, and it's asking me if I recognize those. Uh, yes. I recognize those. Okay, so Watson Down said, um, it looks okay, actually, my card hasn't been used. Um, Watson's put a stop on my card and ordered me a new one. Right. So this is a directed conversation where I've now got my problem solved because I've chatted with a computer system in natural language and um, it's taken me through a structured process to solve my problem. End of, end of my problem, new card on its way. You imagine that in comparison to the stress of how the hell do I phone my bank when I'm abroad? Right? You can really um, have a different type of interface. And uh, for the teenagers, they're probably going to grow up. You know, I forgot who it was. Somebody had a chart with number of texts, wasn't it? Of, and it was your daughter, wasn't it? M my daughter, I get um, a telephone statement, and it shows me the number of texts. Enormous number, right? Um, She's used to texting. That's, that's the kind of natural interface for a teenager. So building new IT systems that are based on chat interface, it feels natural for her. In, in fact, I was telling Kay earlier, um, my daughter's iPhone, um, she gave it to me once and, and said, Dad, uh, can you fix something for me? And I looked at the screen, and there was no phone button. She'd taken the phone button off the bottom, and she put the messages button there, and she put the phone button in a folder somewhere. I couldn't see it. And I said, Lucy, why, why have you done that? What? She said, well, nobody ever phones anyone. <laughs> we just text each other. Right? So that I could not use this as a telephone. It, it's no longer a telephone. It's a text machine. Right? Hence, building systems like this, where we're taking those people who are behaving like that and get them to interact with the business in natural language just the way they do with their friends. So I, I'd argue that we're at this inflection point in industry um, where technology's moved. Um, we started out, people of my generation started out with um, green screen systems, you know, you type in on the keyboard, character-based interfaces. And then we moved where, when uh, Windows and the Mac came in, we used to mouse with graphical interfaces. We thought it was wonderful. We thought that was the future of the world. And then the iPhone comes out and it's all now touch-based and it's in our pockets. And we never use a mouse anymore because it's all touch-based. Um, we think that the next evolution is cognitive. We're going to move away from all of these types of interfaces to systems which we just talk to. Um, in fact, sometimes when I give these talks, um, I have a chart um, which has got some photographs of uh, famous um, sci-fi movies, you know, Star Trek, etc. And th the point is, I challenge you to find any science fiction movie where 
if they've got a keyboard or a mouse. And that's because if you take away the constraints of what technology does today and say, if, we, if anything were possible, if we could just wave a wand, what would a computer look like? It would be a computer you talk to. Right? Uh, R2-D2, C3PO, um, I don't know, anyone from Blake 7 here? Um, <laughs> I've shown my age, aren't I, right? Zen, um, um, Deep Thought from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, all these things are computers actors talk to. So what we now have the technology ourselves to build real systems that do real things today where we can just talk to them. Um, th that technology is now there and that's what we're doing with Watson. Uh, so this is my uh, penultimate chart. Um, <laughs> so there was um, uh, a survey uh, looking at um, the impact of this kind of technology on different job types and saying, what, what might the implications be for this? Um, there was one job type um, which came out heads above everything else as the job which will be least impacted by this kind of technology. Does anyone hazard a guess? There's a few clues in that photograph. Anyone hazard a guess what that job type is? Go on. Few, ooh, good one, good one, good one. No, priest. <laughs> uh, so there's lots of impacts on society. You know, you only have to look at things like humans and ex machina to kind of decades into the future, what's going to happen. Um, but there's impacts on society. But we think that ultimately um, this is all going to be positive because it moves humans away from operating on the mundane to operating on things where they add value. So if you look at healthcare, um, if you shift people from um, looking at uh, skin cancers and get a computer system that can do it, you can deploy those people in the healthcare industry to areas where they can add much more value. Because things something like healthcare, there's, there's more demand than we can ever uh, fulfill. Right? As soon as you do something, just demand shifts somewhere else. So um, it's going to have an impact, but we think it's hugely positive because we're going to be doing things which um, improve people's lives. So I wanted to finish on this quote um, from the founder of IBM who said, what every business needs is, people, is more people who think. Uh, perhaps what he meant was more computers who think. So that was uh, what I wanted to talk to you about Watson and cognitive computing. Thank you. <laughs>